I'm Kevin O'Brien, the director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Mark Elliott, uh, the professor of Chinese and Inner Asian History in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations of, of Harvard University. Uh, Mark is a graduate of uh, Berkeley. Uh, he graduated here in 1993. Uh, and previous to that, he was a, a graduate student and an undergraduate at Yale. Uh, we were just talking about how we overlapped in the 1980s. Uh, which I can tell you was not a wonderful time to be in New Haven. It was the <laughs> drug and crack capital of the world. Every time my relatives came to visit me, the back lights on their cars would be knocked out and all sorts of things. Uh, so both he and I, I think, have moved up in the world decisively, and I think New Haven has too uh, uh, since then. Uh, Mark has been the acting director of the, the Fairbank uh, Center at various times, the acting chair of the Harvard China Fund, many other administrative uh, responsibilities as well. Uh, his important books include Emperor Qianlong, uh, Son of Heaven, Man of the World, New Qing Imperial History, The Manchu Way. Uh, like a, a lot of uh, Chinese historians these days, he's decided we know as much as we need to know about Chinese history and that we social scientists aren't doing a very good job in the 20th and 21st century. So he's crept up underneath us like all of them and is now taking away our few reasons to continue to exist. Uh, and, and today he's going to be talking about uh, the return of the native, the debate over second generation ethnic policy and, and proving yet further that the historical perspective is something that all of us need on, on questions even of contemporary import. Thanks very much. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here back at, at, at Berkeley. This is a very special place for me at the, the David Keatley uh, podium, my, my, old, uh, my old teacher. Ye um, Wenxin, my my Shijie, uh, here, and I'm I'm really happy to be able to give a talk one last time in this in this room, which I gather won't exist for very much uh, very much longer. Uh, lots of lots of hours spent in this room, usually where where you're sitting, right now. Um, but New Haven, yeah, actually, my my master's thesis was was stolen. Well, it was stolen in the car that it was part in. <laughs> Uh, they didn't steal the thesis to steal the thesis, but I never got that back. Uh, yeah, those were interesting times in, in, in New Haven. So I know what you're, what you're thinking. You're thinking, what's a nice historian boy like me doing in a contemporary topic like this? Well, uh, at the moment, I'm working on a variety of projects, all connected in, in one way or another with the question of the relationship between empire on the one hand and nation state on the other. Uh, and this itself is part of an ongoing and seemingly unending, though I hope not fruitless, uh, effort to understand the meaning and nature of Qing rule and its lasting effects upon modern China and modern Chinese consciousness. Um, part of this uh, effort, one of these projects, has me uh, trying uh, to better grasp what happened to the Manchus after the fall of the dynasty how they were first unmade and then remade into today's, uh, in today, today's Manchus, called Manzu in, uh, in modern China. So why uh, was this people brought back from the verge of disappearance? And how has it become the third largest ethnic group in China today? Now that's one, uh, uh, one story that, uh, that I'm pursuing right now. It's not today's topic. Another project, another part of this, uh, uh, this effort has me investigating Manchu notions of empire and political legitimacy in the Qing and looking for their lingering influence upon discourse, institutions, and practice in the 20th century and in contemporary China. And I throw this map up. Uh, I had to have a map of the Qing somewhere in this talk and might as well get it out of the way sooner. Uh, it will be, this relevance to uh, uh, the talk will become apparent in the middle. Right now, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that the light shaded uh, purple areas, uh, areas under the Ming with the uh, crosshatch there, uh, represented the territory, of course, that the Qing took over in 1644. Uh, the darker purple areas up in the northeast, uh, the territories that they had acquired before they took over China, and then the green areas off to the west and the north, uh, areas that were added to the empire. Uh, in uh, uh, the course of the uh, 16th and 17th, excuse me, the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, one thing I think is inaccurate about this map, though, is, of course, Taiwan, which was not part of the Ming Empire. Uh, it is uh, included here as uh, having been so. Of course, this was another Qing conquest of the 17th century. 
Now, this, these two projects, one on the Manchus and the other on the lingering, uh, the, 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 uh, what I call the imperial hangover of the 20th century, um, have led me to the study of modern ethnic politics in the People's Republic of China today. And these policies have been uh, lately the subject of an unusually vigorous uh, debate a very open debate, which is the focus of today's paper, and which uh, actually I've never even given this talk in English before. I've only ever given this talk in, uh, in Chinese. So uh, this is a bit of a, of a trial run. Uh, I'm very much uh, looking forward to your uh, comments and, and questions. So what is this debate? Well, this debate is one that began uh, maybe, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, but that has really picked up speed uh, in uh, the last five years. Uh, since the eruption of serious violence in Tibet in 2008, and then uh, a year or so later in Xinjiang in 2009, uh, scarcely a month goes by without uh, new evidence of deepening discontent somewhere in China's inner Asian frontiers, those green areas I showed you a minute ago that were added to the, to the uh, territory of China uh, under the Qing. Now, the official position of the government is that the primary source of these troubles lies in the activities of separatist elements, uh, and not with any structural flaws in the policies created to deal with non-Han people. All the same, uh, government spokesmen are finding it harder and harder to claim that har harmony reigns among all of China's 55 recognized minority groups, and you'll recognize the, uh, the image from the uh, publicity for today's talk. Uh, showed uh, one of those uh, happy scenes. In fact, in February 2012, uh, the party's unofficial English language organ, uh, the Huanqiu Shibao, also known as the Global Times, acknowledged, quote, it is true that in recent years, Tibet and Xinjiang have not been as peaceful as before. So that's the, that's the party talking. Um, other uh, voices from the party are more explicit, saying, quote, we cannot disguise the fact that there have been flaws in the ways ethnic policies have been carried out. So then the question is, question has become, what to do about it? It must be ad admitted, I think, uh, that the uh, challenge of managing the affairs of the country's roughly 114 million people, 114 million citizens, that's the population of, of Mexico, a pretty good sized country. Uh, those are the, that's the number of people who identify themselves as non-Han in China today. Managing the affairs of these people is no easy matter. We have to say that right up front. Um, but the basic choice as to what to do about current ethnic policies is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, either present policies are continued with efforts to improve implementation, or present policies are significantly modified or abandoned altogether, and a new order, a new system created to solve the problem of ethnic conflict. One of the suggestions that has come out in the last few years for uh, such a new order is what uh, is being called this second generation ethnic policy, or in Chinese, di er dai, min zu zheng ce. Uh, and I guess, I guess it seems uh, that the idea is that every 60 years, a public policy needs to be rethought. Uh, and so uh, that's one generation. 60 years is one generation in public policy, so uh, it's time for a second generation. Now, this term was first coined by Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe, who are a couple of scholars at Tsinghua University. But the most prominent person associated with this line, with this second generation policy, is Beida sociologist uh, Ma Rong. And I'll say more about uh, Ma Rong in, in a little bit. Uh, this is actually, this uh, image is taken from an article uh, written by Ma Rong, who publishes extensively both in Chinese and in English. Uh, and you can see uh, that he has uh, given his own coding uh, to the different uh, minority areas, uh, the different autonomous areas uh, in, uh, China, uh, in, uh, in China today. Now, Ma Rong advocates the elimination of minority nationality status, together with the abolition of the institutions of autonomous rule that have been in effect since the early years of the People's Republic, and in some cases, such as in the case of Inner Mongolia, from before the foundation of the uh, PRC. Inner Mongolia as an autonomous region was created in 1946 or 47, I believe. So he would do away with all of these uh, different uh, uh, autonomous uh, regions. Uh, in its place, Ma favors a model of ethnic assimilation 
uh, that he derives from the experience of countries in the West, principally the US. And in promoting this idea and in rejecting the term minzu in favor of zuchun, uh, Ma's uh, stated goal is to depoliticize, or to use his term, qiu zhengzhihua, to depoliticize ethnic identity and ethnic discourse in China, and thereby to ease the continued difficulties experienced by leaders in the administration of non-Han areas. So his goal is to simplify problems by just taking the political element out altogether and make Minzu a purely uh, cultural and legal thing that does not get written in your, uh, actually it was not get written in your, in your identity papers anymore. It'll be purely, purely cultural uh, and uh, thereby uh, problems will be solved. Everybody, as, a, as will become clear, uh, will find a different kind of identity. And this is, uh, again, a, a rather uh, great task uh, with pretty significant implications for all kinds of things in the country when you consider that two thirds of China consists of territories that are covered under the laws pertaining to autonomous regions or zones or prefectures or counties. Two thirds of the country would be affected by any change in, the, in Minzu policy. So this may seem at first glance to be something that affects only those 10% or so of the population. Uh, yeah, that's true in terms of the numbers of people involved. Uh, it's a, a relatively small number compared to the total population of the country, although, as I said a minute ago, it's still 114 million people. That's a third of the population of this country. That's a lot of people. Uh, more to the point, maybe, is the fact that it covers two-thirds of the country's territory, and in particular, uh, some very sensitive geopolitical areas. Now, according to Ma, who is himself a Hui, he's a Huizu, uh, the present, that is to say a Chinese Muslim, uh, the present patchwork of peoples produces conflict uh, that is endemic and that may lead to the eventual disintegration of the state. Potential national independence movements, he says, are the greatest threat that China faces in the 21st century. And when you consider all the, all the challenges that China faces in the 20th, 21st century, which are considerable, to say that this one is the greatest one is uh, saying something, whether we agree with that or not. Ma blames the adoption of the Soviet model as laying the basis for present problems, and he says that a second generation policy will lead to a more stable social outcome, whereby Han and non-Han alike will be assimilated into a single ma nation made up not of Han and Mongols and Tibetans and Zhuang and other kinds of people, but of an indivisible consolidated Chinese nation, defined as the Zhonghua Minzu, uh, and uh, that's the term here uh, at the bottom. Uh, the underlying idea behind this is to create a community of citizens bound together in a shared political enterprise, which I think it's hard to, hard to disagree with, the, uh, uh, with, with that objective. Uh, for this to occur, Ma argues that a significant strengthening uh, of China's legal system is necessary, among other things, which would ensure improved levels of social justice, such that there would be satisfactory guarantees of protection of cultural freedoms promised by the state, more along the lines of Western liberal pluralism. Now this second generation policy debate itself, quite apart from the, the policy is one thing, but the, bait, the, the debate about the policy is itself, I think, worthy of, of note. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One is that it's happening openly. It's happening in the pages of academic journals. It's happening in the pages of quasi-academic journals. It's happening in newspapers. It's happening in blogs. Uh, it's happening uh, all over the place, including in party publications. And this, when I first began seeing these, uh, these different uh, uh, essays and, and articles, I was quite surprised because, generally speaking, ethnic issues, especially when you use words like Tibet and Xinjiang, this is pretty sensitive, typically, right? Uh, and yet, people were talking about it uh, uh, and disagreeing with each other uh, in pretty basic ways. Uh, all over the place. And the second thing that I think is remarkable about, remarkable about this debate is that Western anthropological theory and a comparative framework are uh, shaping the debate in some pretty fundamental ways, uh, which, again, you don't see, uh, you don't see all that uh, often. 
Now, of course, there have been, there have been some uh, limits to the way that this framework works, and, and one in particular limit in, is, is uh, the focus of, of the later part of, of, of my remarks today. But I want to begin uh, the, uh, the main part of the talk here by first saying something about the debate and then about this, this comparative framework. Now, on the debate, opinions about the Di Ardai Minzu Zhengzi, the second generation ethnic policy, are, are pretty divided. Uh, even if people sympathize with Mao Rong's assessment of the country's ethnic situation, many scholars oppose his theoretical premises uh, and his proposals. They fear that the dismantling of the structures uh, of ethnic identity that had been carefully nourished over many decades, with the significant exception of the Cultural Revolution, would be the, be the beginning of the end for non-Han identity in, uh, in China, uh, and uh, the beginning of the end for non-Han cultures in China. Removing even the modest protections offered for uh, native culture and religion that presently exist, people say, some people say, would leave uh, them uh, vulnerable to even greater Han domination. Mostly this kind of view is expressed off the record uh, in private conversations with people, uh, especially with non-Han scholars, but not only with non-Han scholars, by any means, actually. Uh, and there are occasionally published articles, uh, one in particular by a scholar at Fudan University, a scholar from Mongolia named Naran Bilik, uh, Narir Bilik, uh, has come out pretty, pretty strongly criticizing people uh, for uh, failing to see, failing to understand how the second generation policy would be perceived by non-Han people, for failing to, to take the, the position of, of a non-Han uh, non -Han person in China and to understand things from their point of view. So a majority of party spokesmen seem to agree that a fundamental shift in ethnic policies is probably not a good idea. One representative voice is that of Hao Shiyuan, uh, an ethnic Mongol who is Deputy Secretary General of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, so a fairly influential, fairly powerful uh, uh, academician in, uh, in, the, in the country. And in 2010, uh, he uh, made uh, the following uh, remarks. Uh, essentially, as you can see, are arguing for the uh, need to uh, preserve uh, the current uh, system, that it has done the job of uh, protecting the unity and integrity of, the national, of national territory, which was one of the main things that it was conceived of uh, to do. The very next year, uh, in another essay, uh, Hao Shiyuan, uh, and this is a, a not so veiled criticism of, uh, of Ma Rong, um, uh, he uh, questions the very uh, idea of what Ma Rong is trying to do. And uh, the part that I've highlighted here uh, suggests that uh, the very idea that one should go about uh, questioning the basis, of, uh, the, the basis of ethnic policies in China, the whole idea that there should be minority nationalities, or Shao Shu Minzu, as we've uh, come to call them, although they're not called that anymore in most places, uh, that this is wrong. This is just. Uh, this is just wrong-headed. This is not the way to go about solving the problem. This will simply uh, create more problems in its wake. And in 2010, so around this same time, also the Tongjanbu, the United Front Work Department, which is responsible for uh, handling a lot of ethnic policy uh, uh, with the party, within the party, uh, spent uh, one chapter in its annual review of current political thinking just talking about ethnic uh, relations, and they focused in particular on Ma Rong and the second generation policy and this whole depoliticization program that he uh, is trying uh, to launch. And they summarize it fairly uh, neutrally, I would say, but they're clearly disapproving of uh, what uh, he had uh, to say and spend a long time citing the objections of various of Ma's critics, including Hao Shu Yuan, uh, by saying that this uh, a political approach to ethnicity is just not suited to China's historical realities. But around the same time, again in 2011, other people also with very strong uh, party uh, connections, uh, and uh, uh, Huang Gang is, is, is uh, in the uh, Chinese uh, People's Political Consultative Conference, uh, they uh, came forward to support the idea of reformulating ethnic policy from the ground up but not on the same principles, not on the same premises necessarily as Ma Rong. So their uh, initial contributions to the debate came uh, in uh, a uh, uh, discussion of a conference that was held in 2010 to discuss the situation in Tibet 
and Xinjiang, uh, and they came up with uh, this particular formulation of moving from uh, contact to exchange and then to something like fusion or integration, depending on how you want to translate it. So I provided both languages here. Uh, contact is jiao wang, right? And then jiao liu is uh, exchange, so that's a little deeper. And then the next step after that is bringing people together in a single, uh, a single unit. So that's jiao rong or jiao rong yi ti, making into, uh, I've translated that in, in one, one case here as amalgamation, making things into, into one body. Uh, and this comes up over and over, as you see uh, in, their, uh, in their analysis. Now, as I say, this is not what Ma Rong says, but uh, it's the same idea, which is that ethnic policies need to be reconsidered, that the present situation is not tenable. Uh, their article is interesting also because it makes use of uh, a term that we hardly ever see in discourse in the People's Republic of China by talking, and when talking about the people. They use this term uh, guozu here, which is a term that we see mostly really in the Republic of China. It's very uncommon in, uh, in, in PRC writing, at least anything uh, that I have seen. Uh, and the fact that they're moving around looking for the right words suggests to me that uh, they are concerned about the consequences of the lack of a strong national identity and the problems that many writers, very, uh, uh, you know, very resourceful people, still have with terminology when it comes to talking about the kinds of lingering issues that remain of trying to solve the problem of turning what was a multinational empire into a nation state or something that is trying to be, anyway, a nation state in some, uh, in some sense. Uh, and uh, you know, here again, uh, the, uh, uh, the problem or, or their, their approach is that ethnic identity, that is to say the identity of non-Han peoples, needs to be weakened in favor of creating a single overarching national identity that everybody can work with and live with and feel right, and, and, and identify with. Uh, and this they see as the solution to the problem. So this is not what Ma Rong is talking about. Ma Rong is talking about a way of using the law to try and preserve uh, the uh, uh, various uh, institutions and, and, and cultures of non-Han peoples. But he wants to get rid of the, um, the political apparatus that goes along with that. The two who's uh, are uh, not, they don't want that at all. They want to get rid of, excuse me, they want to get rid of uh, all of those uh, uh, different, uh, they don't want there to be any, any uh, minzu at all. It's all Zhonghua minzu. Everybody is simply Chinese. So there's a lot to, to comment uh, on here, uh, but uh, again, the idea, the basic idea of the importance of the Zhonghua minzu, uh, the Chinese people, uh, where we get away from minority and majority issues, uh, and uh, ethnicity as a phenomenon goes away, just as Marx predicted it would back in the middle of the 19th century. And the way that that will happen is by the fusing, the fusing of peoples. Uh, and here uh, they have one particular quotation that leaped out at me, the Han people who have number in the majority among the Zhonghua Minzu have always been a very inclusive people and have incorporated many other peoples who did not originally belong to the Han. Now, of course, this is precisely what non-Han in China today fear the most. Uh, they fear their own disappearance. Uh, it's, reading this, it's as if the clock was turned back 70 years and we were reading Chiang Kai-shek and China's destiny. Uh, and it's really ironic that somebody, uh, that the party, some people within the party today would propose a, 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 a policy like this, I think, given that it was the party's support of non-Han peoples in contrast to the KMT that helped bring the party to power in the first place back in the 1940s. Uh, so uh, it's no wonder, I think, that talk of a second generation ethnic policy has uh, raised a lot of concerns. But it's also all the more remarkable, I think, that this debate is still happening in the open, as I say. It's not happening. Uh, I'm sure there are debates that are happening behind closed doors, too. But a lot of what people are thinking, uh, they, are saying, they are saying openly. At stake here is not just national unity, but also, to some degree, I think, also party legitimacy and ideological orthodoxy. 
So in this connection, I think uh, it's worth noting the storm unleashed when Zhu Weixun, who is executive, or was, executive vice director of the United Front Work Department. He was uh, the number two person in the Tongzhan Bu. Uh, he came out publicly, this is the highest party person to do so, publicly in favor of some version of a second generation ethnic policy in February 2012, so just about a year and a half ago. He adopted a position somewhere between Ma, Rong, and the two, uh, the two Hus. People joke about this debate. They say this is a debate between a horse, a pig, and two foxes. Uh, Jew cautioned against imposing bureaucratic measures uh, forcefully to promote ethnic fusion. This is kind of a summary of what's up, what's up here. Um, he says, uh, and this is the part uh, that I put in red, building fusion, this idea of, of uh, amalgamation on a conscious voluntary foundation should per be permitted but that work on ethnicity should be oriented toward respecting difference, tolerating diversity, and facilitating ethnic mixing. He is emphatic to, in pointing out here that fusion, or this Jiao Rong idea, was not the same thing as assimilation or sinification. Right? He says here, this Ronghe and Jiao Rong is not sinification, bu shi han hua, because he knows that people will see it this way. So he is at pains to point out that that's not what it is. But he also points out that it is important to move forward and change with the times. So he's allowing for the possibility uh, that things may change. And a couple of years later, uh, in, uh, as you see in this quotation, he came out even more strongly uh, to uh, uh, say that it was time to do away with ethnic classifications altogether. He was not in favor of a federal system. He said that very specifically. Um, he said that anybody who proposed that uh, was uh, uh, getting uh, their ideas from powers on the outside. Uh, but uh, he believed uh, that uh, it was important uh, to try and uh, change things around. Uh, and in particular, he said, to pay close attention to promoting the spread of a common national language and writing system, which is, of course, code for uh, eliminating uh, languages such as Uyghur and Tibetan, uh, and uh, replacing those with spoken uh, Chinese and written Chinese, which is again one of the touch, one of the flashpoints of, of ethnic policy in uh, in these areas. He did say he personally felt this way. He was not necessarily speaking for the party. I think I'm not sure, Kevin, if that is an important distinction or not, where he says, well, good, and I personally feel this way. But a lot of people, particularly a lot of non-Han people, people, some people I know, were alarmed when the head, basically the head of the, of the, of the United Front Department made these, made these comments, that this maybe this was going to happen, that this was a trial balloon that was going up, and pretty soon there was going to be uh, some change made. We see similar, uh, at this time, uh, similar remarks by other reform-minded leaders. Wang Yang, for example, in Guangdong, um, went on record as saying that uh, things needed to change with the times, and that included ethnic policies as well. So this, again, uh, gave uh, uh, some hints that maybe some people in the party were being encouraged to talk about the idea of changing ethnic policies, and maybe they would be changing in this direction, or maybe in another direction. Uh, nobody was really quite sure. And yet, we got uh, other uh, pushback from other people uh, who, uh, for example, uh, this was an editorial in uh, the Global Times, again, a party paper, uh, from a professor at Minzu Dashue uh, named Xiong Kun Xin. Uh, very uh, uh, passionate, really, I think, uh, against a second generation policy, uh, saying uh, anybody who wants to depoliticize ethnic questions is thinking, uh, basically, is this pie in the sky uh, thinking, he says. And if we do carry out these reforms, he writes, we truly will end up following in the footsteps of the Soviet Union. So this, you can't get much more explicit than this in Chinese political writing, publicly, I think. Now, this is somebody who is clearly worried, or at least doing a very good imitation of being worried. 
So that's the broad outline then of the uh, second generation uh, ethnic uh, debate as it has unfolded pretty much up to the end of uh, 2012. And I have been looking around, I haven't seen a whole lot more activity in the last year and that may be owing to the fact that we've had a change in, in administration and people are keeping their powder dry and waiting to see how things will, will play out. But I, I don't think that this is, uh, this is over yet. Now, in the time I, I have left, another uh, maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, I want to focus on two aspects of, of this debate and what they can tell us about attitudes uh, toward, uh, uh, toward the constitution of China today toward the non-Han and the place of the non-Han in contemporary society and ways of thinking and talking about uh, those things. So the first point, as I've said already, uh, is that it's pretty extraordinary that this debate is happening publicly at all. Uh, we don't get public policy debates about what should happen in the South China Sea. Uh, we don't get the public debates about what should happen to monetary rates or anything like that. Sometimes you do see some debate, and, and uh, Kevin, I'm sure, knows, knows, may, may have more examples uh, at, uh, at his fingertips. Sometimes there have been debates about family planning policy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the press uh, somewhat, uh, but these have tended to be pretty uh, short-lived. So for whatever reason, nationality's policy seems to have been singled out for special treatment, that it's okay to come out with a whole bunch of different ideas uh, about what uh, ought to be done with ethnic, uh, with, with, with these kinds of ethnic policies. And as I said already, uh, the stakes are pretty high. Uh, Ma Rong, in putting forward uh, his, his plan, and then the others uh, as well, really, are all implicitly challenging the orthodoxy that has been in place uh, for at least the last 20, if not 30 years, uh, that was uh, erected by uh, Fei Xiaotong, uh, shown here, who was, in fact, Ma Rong's own uh, professor. And Fei, as, as many of you will know, is the author of this uh, theory of the unified polyethnic uh, nation or unified polyethnic national configuration. There are many different translations for Tongyi de Dominzhou Guojia Gejiu, but this is the formula that we're all familiar with about what makes China hold together today with the 55 minority groups and the one uh, majority group openly recognizing China's ethnic diversity uh, in Fei's uh, theory, which was uh, worked out in uh, a number of articles that eventually became a book, of course, uh, was uh, supposed to provide the basis for a stable system uh, that would regularize uh, the, uh, uh, the order, the ethnic order between Han and non-Han uh, in such a way that everybody uh, would be represented, uh, the political will of the whole country would be respected. Now, in, in questioning this, this orthodoxy, Ma Rong has put his finger precisely on the central problem that Fei's theory left unexplained, which hinges on what to do about the Zhonghua Minzu, the Chinese people that were supposed to emerge out of this uh, grand unification. And that problem is that no one in China, uh, at least nobody I know, and, and I, I, again, I, I may be wrong about that, um, but... Uh, Almost nobody, anyway, identifies himself or herself as a member of the Zhonghua Minzu. I mean, if you talk to people in China, usually they'll say, right, I'm Chinese, or they'll say, I'm Han, or I'm Hui. It's very hard to find anybody who will stand up and say, because that's not a Minzu you can write on your identity card. That's not a legally recognized Minzu identity status. It's, in fact, nowhere in the Chinese constitution. So this is a problem because nobody, although everybody is supposed to identify with the idea of being part of the Chinese people in the formulation of being Zhonghua Minzu, nobody does. So this then leaves room for debate over what Zhonghua Minzu actually is uh, supposed to mean. Uh, and this gets us into pretty deep water pretty quickly because all of these terms go back many centuries and have all kinds of accretions of, of meaning uh, over time that do not lend themselves to very uh, clear uh, separation. Again, the that there is a debate at all going on publicly about what the Zhonghua Minzu are or should be is, I think, pretty, it's very interesting to read about. I'll just say that. 
Um, one scholar has argued that uh, culture actually remains the pivot of what Zhonghua Minzu uh, really is. He writes, according to the uh, above logical relation, which he, he's laid out there, it is the people and culture of Zhonghua that constituted the site of the traditional values of national identity. But he goes on to say that the connection between politics and culture are complex, and that memory of long-standing structures of oppositional identity between the Han and the Nanhan, or as phrased classically, between the Huaxia peoples and the Yidi peoples, uh, that this still plays a role in how people think about each other today in China, uh, which is not a politically correct position to take. But there it is. Uh, and this is uh, the scholar is, is, uh, is published in, in 2012, a scholar named Ren Yong uh, in, in Beijing. So what we have here uh, in, this, uh, in this debate and in the critique and the, different, the discussion about the debate is a, uh, a criticism, really, of the, of the status quo. And uh, again, I think this, we, we, I come, come back again to the idea that this is a, a very unusual, uh, unusual thing. Ma's suggestion that change is needed for true equality to be recognized or to be realized between all of China's peoples carries the implication that numerous party statements to the effect uh, that there already is complete equality among all the citizens of the People's Republic of China are not true. Nobody's yet called him on this, but that certainly seems to be the implication when he is saying that uh, we have work to do still. Uh, moreover, uh, in order for his proposed changes to take effect, it would be ne necessary to change Article 4 of the Constitution of the PRC. Uh, along with various other uh, associated articles. Uh, Article 4 is what governs the status of uh, non-Han peoples and the territories they occupy in uh, the Chinese state and is generally regarded both by observers within China and outside China as one of the things guaranteeing the political stability of the entire country. Is there really the political will to start messing around with Article 4 of the Constitution then is the question. Ma seems to be aware of the implications of tinkering with the definitions of, of what a minzu is. Uh, uh, in this uh, statement here, uh, he criticizes somebody who says that Zhonghua minzu actually uh, is only used in the plural sense, which I think actually most of us would, I don't know, I would agree with that statement. When people use Zhonghua minzu, often what they really mean are the different minzu, the various different ethnic groups in the plural of China. But Moron criticizes this, uh, and he says, if one accepts this view, then the implications extend very broadly. We'd have to rewrite the national anthem, for example. Yeah. Uh, and here again, uh, where uh, he says, if we acknowledge that between some ethnic groups and the Han, there exists a difference in identification. In other words, some people identify more with their own ethnic group, with their own minzu, or to use the contemporary term, their own zuqun, and not zhonghua minzu. We have a problem. And well, this is, in fact, I think, the, the case. And that's pretty much what Ma Rong uh, is saying. But he has been able to publish as he likes. He continues to, to uh, publish new books all the time. I had breakfast with him in August. Uh, he seems just fine, and he can continue to do and write and say pretty much what he likes. So this is a debate that is continuing, as, uh, as I say. Now, the second aspect of this debate that I want to talk about has to do with the framing of the question about how properly to understand ethnicity within the Chinese context. And this debate has proceeded along a couple of different tracks. Um, the first uh, focuses on the proper terms, or has focused on the proper terms in Chinese for thinking about ethnicity. And the second has to do with the comparability of China's ethnic situation and the search for analogies to think about in comparison or relation to uh, China's situation. Both of these things, both the search for a good term and the search for good analogies, um, are attempts to put the discussion at a high level, actually, of uh, of comparison and take a global perspective, in fact, which I think is another very interesting thing uh, about the way that this debate is being carried on. 
Now, I'm not going to say much about the, the search for terms. What this has to do with really has to do more with the, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the idea that we have um, Minzu doesn't, doesn't work very well for most people. Uh, and so uh, we were going to use this word uh, Zuchun. Uh, and the word Zuchun was invented in Taiwan about 20, 25 years ago to mean ethnicity. It was invented by anthropologists in Taiwan. Let me go back actually to the uh, earlier slide here. Zuchun, there, number, th number three on the list. Minzu means too many different things that don't mean the same thing in English. And so scholars came up with this new term, uh, which has pretty much been adopted most, uh, most places these days if we're talking about ethnicity or ethnic, this word Zuchun now in the mainland also is uh, the word that gets used most of the time. So this is a, a deliberate equivalent for ethnicity, which is there to make it possible to talk about ethnicity in both the Chinese context and in other contexts as well, and to keep uh, that part of the, of the equation constant. Right? So uh, that is, in terms of uh, this, this debate about ethnicity, this is uh, the uh, uh, consensus that has emerged, which is to talk about this, we need a common term. This is going to be the term we use. Uh, and this will make it possible for us then uh, to, uh, talk, to, to say what we mean, particularly if we're talking uh, with, uh, uh, with foreigners, but not, not only then, uh, 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 also with, uh, with each other. Again, because so many Chinese scholars today uh, in anthropology, as in many other fields as well, are getting their ideas from the same place we get our ideas. We're all reading the same books now. Right. We're all more and more using a common vocabulary of analysis and concepts. It's not the way that it was 25, 30 years ago. Another reason to go to Zuchun is to get away from this hard word Minzu, because the word Minzu, of course, also means nation and nationality. And uh, we all know what happens to nationalities, right? We just look at the USSR. Nationalities like the Uzbeks or the Armenians or the Tajiks they become nations. We just take off the ality part from minzu, and you, or you add a guajia, and it from, goes from a shaoshu minzu to a minzu guajia. So we want to take minzu out of the equation altogether. We don't want to be talking about nations or potential nations. That's not the language we want to be using. So we substitute this other word, zuchun, ethnicity. And that gets us into a world of multiculturalism. It gets us to a world of polyethnicity, it gets us away from multinationals, it gets us further away from uh, the USSR. The other important result of using Zuchun as a conscious equivalent of ethnicity in Chinese is that it suggests that China's ethnic situation is not sui generis, it's not unique in the world, uh, but is comparable, in fact, to ethnic situations other places. Commentators who use Zuchun uh, believe in the, uh, as, you see, as you can see here, they believe that uh, Chinese actually can learn something from the way that other places, other countries, have handled their ethnic problems, too. China is not alone. The problems China faces in dealing with minority ethnicities inside the country are arguably not so dissimilar uh, to those we find elsewhere. And this has become, I think, a second imported, important meta-narrative uh, in the overall uh, uh, second-generation ethnic policy uh, discussion. A lot of people uh, make frequent reference to eth ethnic policies other places, but uh, Ma Rong is probably one of the most active, again, having studied here, uh, he writes regularly about the need to approach ethnicity in China. This is a main part of his thesis in the same way that ethnicity is approached in the U.S. And uh, this has led him uh, to, to a conviction that ethnicity can be dealt with purely as a matter of culture, uh, and all we have to do is look at the example of the American melting pot, otherwise known as the Dao Rong Lu, uh, which uh, is much better than the alternative, which is the ethnic hors d'oeuvre platter, uh, which is the best translation I could come up with, with Minzu Da Pi Pin Pat, 
another variation on that is the uh, minzu shalawan, the minzu salad bowl, where things are all in the same bowl, but they're not mixed up together. Whereas in a ronglu, they're fused, right? You can't tell one from the other uh, anymore. There's a lot of appeal to this. The weird thing is, of course, that nobody in the United States believes in the, in the melting pot idea anymore and hasn't for at least, I don't know, 40 years. Um, uh, you know, this, uh, this whole idea was discarded at, at least in the 60s, if not before. In fact, the people who were instrumental in getting rid of it, uh, uh, Nathan Glazer and, and Patrick Daniel Moynihan, were the ones who invented the word ethnicity to get away from having to talk about, or for, for, for finding a way to talk about what happens when ethnic groups stick together and don't melt, which is what they found was happening in American cities. Um, so it's really hard, I think, to find anybody who believes in the melting pot as an accurate description of ethnic dynamics, either in the United States or in the UK or France or Germany or, or, or anywhere. Um, and so for that reason, it seems to me that his advocacy that this new policy will result in a melting pot in the People's Republic, um, where boundaries between the Han and non-Han will gradually be, uh, be overcome, uh, seems pretty poorly uh, conceived. And his rationale for ending preferences for minorities, because that's another thing that he wants to do, right? Minorities right now are allowed to have, they get extra points for getting into university. They are given preferences when it comes to uh, family planning. Uh, he wants to end all of that. And he points to affirmative action in the United States. And he argues that if there were no affirmative action in the United States, there would be no more ethnic tension in the United States. And that affirmative action is what keeps ethnic tension going and ethnic difference perpetuated in the US. I'm not a sociologist. Uh, I'm not a, a student of American society. Uh, but as far as I know, there's not very much evidence to support this idea. At most, we can say it is hotly contested. It's certainly far from a, 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 a given. But I don't want to suggest that Ma is wrong to look outside China for examples of other models of managing ethnic relations. What I would suggest is that he's chosen the wrong analogy. He's barking up the wrong tree. If you're going to look at societies globally, I think a far better analogy than looking at, say, African Americans or British Asians or uh, Francais d'origine algérienne or Deutsch Türken, a better analogy would be that of Native Americans in the US, uh, would be, or, or in Mexico for that matter, First Peoples in Canada, Aboriginal peoples in Australia, Maori in New Zealand. Uh, or uh, native peoples in any number of South American countries, such as Ecuador or Peru or Brazil. The situation of many of China's non-Han peoples, the vast majority of whom have been living in their homelands for many centuries and whose presence there long predates the arrival of people from the Zhongyuan or from Neidi, bears, in my view, much more similarity to that of Aboriginal peoples around the world than to emigrant populations such as Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, uh, Europeans, and others now living in the United States and elsewhere. The parallels on, on many levels, whether you look at income or share of GDP, education, vital statistics, historical experience, cultural crisis, linguistic crisis, all of these things, uh, the parallels between Chinese minorities with, say, the Inuit, in Canada, with Native Americans, with uh, Aborigines in Australia, are striking. All of these groups, or significant majorities of their population, continue to live on lands to which they have reasonably strong ancestral claims. And in their encounter with the majority other, all of them assume the status of natives coming into contact with the representatives of a central power, either colonial or quasi-colonial power, from the outside. All of them find themselves in positions of relative weakness as a result of an asymmetrical power structure, often as a consequence of technological inferiority. Here are some of the words for aborigines or native peoples in Chinese. Yuan zhu mean, yuan zhu mean, xian zhu mean, tu zhu ren. Tu zhu ren is usually used for indigenous peoples. The others are usually used for aborigines. And then we have this other word, indigeneity, 
uh, which in Chinese is usually written, uh, uh, usually translated as Tu uh, Xing. Now, with the ex significant exception of Taiwan, which I won't have time to talk about today, there is no discussion anywhere in the Chinese literature on ethnicity or on ethnic policy of Aborigines. There's none. Um, you can search all the scholarly articles you like, and we can do that now pretty efficiently using the wonderful CNKI database going back many decades. Uh, the only articles in which these words appear uh, are in articles written either about Aboriginal peoples in other countries or articles translated from other languages, but also that don't talk about China. Uh, I've only found one example uh, of uh, an article in which the word Aboriginal peoples is used to talk about people in China. I found one article, and only the one, uh, from 2007. Uh, and it's quite striking. Uh, he uses this word, and he says, I use it because I can't think of any, I can't find any other word in Chinese to mean what I mean. I return to my earlier theme about the poverty of terminology and how this gets in the way very often of establishing a conversation across uh, not just across disciplines, uh, but across, uh, 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 across the sea. So the basic question that I have been asking myself and trying to answer is why should this be so? Why? I mean, if it seems so obvious to somebody like myself, who is, you know, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a specialist in policy, but it just seems obvious to me somehow um, that, uh, uh, that these situations should be uh, comparable. How come nobody in China, where there are lots and lots of smart people, has thought so too? Uh, especially at a time when it's clear that it's OK to talk about ethnic policy on a very op in a very open way. So why is no one talking about the situation of Aboriginal peoples in other countries with reference to Tibetans or Uyghurs or Zhuang or Yi or Bai or Miao or any one of a number of other people? Um, well, the answer to the question is actually quite simple. And the answer is there are no Aboriginal peoples in China. There just aren't any. Uh, and there aren't any not because there can't be anthropologically or can't be sociologically. Um, but there can't be for political reasons. To use the discourse of Aboriginal peoples would risk, first of all, complicated associations with international norms on the rights of First Nation peoples. That is to say, if the government were to abandon the present discourse, the paradigm of uh, minority ethnics, Shaoshu uh, Minzu or Shaoshu Zuchun, and instead acknowledge that some of the non-Han peoples that constitute the Zhonghua Minzu were in fact Yuan Zhumin, they were in fact Aborigines, then from the center's point of view, this would open up a Pandora's box of problems. Right? Uh, for instance, the PRC might feel pressure to comply with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Complaints from dissatisfied ethnic groups could be lodged with the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And just as the US has an uneasy relationship with the International Court of Justice in The Hague, uh, the PRC, too, might see UN judgments on ethnic affairs in China as an unwanted intervention. Uh, I show you here articles 25 and 26 from the UN Convention, uh, the Declaration on the Rights of uh, Native Peoples. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, so on. They have the rights to the lands, and so forth. Now, doubtless, it was resistance to the idea of UN authority over indigenous issues like these that led the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia to all vote against this declaration when it was proposed in the UN in 2007, although it passed anyway. But China signed this declaration, unlike the United States, unlike the US. And so as a signatory, it would have the obligation to abide by its principles if it were to recognize the existence of indigenous peoples within its borders. 
And so long as it does not exist or not admit that there are any Aboriginal peoples inside China, this issue is at arm's length, right? It's not a problem. The other thing, though, of course, is that the idea of indigeneity of this, this Tu Zhu Xing would appear to be very much at odds with China's conception of itself as a unified polyethnic state. And in response to earlier discussions at the UN in 2004, prior to that, uh, those declarations, one of the uh, Chinese representatives, who was at the time a professor of international relations at Beida, Qin Xiaomei, uh, he was asked, does China have any problems with indigenous peoples? And she said, we don't have any. Right? Because indigenous peoples only are created when colonizers have made them so. This is how he has interpreted the, uh, the United Nations statement on this. Um, whether the UN, uh, I, don't, I don't read this in, 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 in the language of, uh, of the United Nations uh, statement, but even if we did, um, the idea that there is no colonialism in Chinese history is one that is, uh, I think, also up uh, for, uh, for question. And a lot of the uh, new research about the nature of the Qing Empire, and here I come back to some of my earlier interests, um, uh, is that the expansion of uh, the uh, Manchu state into Inner Asia in the 17th and 18th centuries, as shown on that earlier map, was conquest and colonization. But of course, the correct view in China is that this was unification. This was a grand project of uniting the country together. Now, whether grand unification accurately represents the view of a refugee from the Dzungar Mongol tribe in 1759 or not is a question that I will leave you with, but I, that's another debate. So just let me finish this up here. Uh, one other reason that we don't get uh, comparisons of China's non-Han minorities with any of the world's aboriginal peoples is that this would not solve any problems. Right? If depoliticization, Chu Zheng Zhuhua, is about making it easier to handle affairs of non-Han peoples in China, then turning to the idea of aboriginal peoples or, or indigenous peoples doesn't help things at all. In fact, it makes them worse. It makes them uh, much, uh, much worse. Not only would ethnicity paired with indigeneity remain a political issue, but it would be explicitly tied to land claims and to exploitation of natural resources on lands that are ostensibly controlled by non-Han peoples, which are pretty significant in Tibet and in Xinjiang and in Mongolia, as uh, you all uh, doubtless uh, know. So this whole idea runs contrary then to what the, the uh, stated political goals of this policy discussion uh, are supposed to be uh, all about, which is to reduce the tension uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Tibet and reduce the tension in, in Xinjiang. Uh, this would not solve that problem. It would heighten the tension. It would heighten worries about security of national borders. Uh, it would make, uh, it would become even more Zheng Zhihua because the problem of deterritorialization uh, would uh, be instead a problem of territorialization of ethnic claims, since that is very much part of the discourse of, um, uh, around in indigenous peoples. So I'm going to end by saying that I just I find it both exceptional and encouraging that this debate on politics includes a par comparative perspective of this sort. I think it permits us a fuller exploration of different angles of the problem that would otherwise remain hidden. It also alerts us to the reasons, the various reasons, why depoliticization may not be so easy when it comes to uh, the uh, question of China's ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic problems. Uh, it may not matter much whether the state gives advantages to these people because of their background or whether there's, uh, your ethnicity is written on your ID card or not. Uh, I don't see that as actually uh, moving the needle very much uh, when it comes to uh, uh, improving the situation of uh, non-Han peoples in China. Whatever you want to call them, uh, a significant proportion of China's non-Han peoples today, like a significant proportion of China's Han people today continue to see themselves as living in a country that deprives ordinary people of basic rights and freedoms. And the second generation policy debate makes it clear that the predicament of today's non-Han peoples will not be solved 
without a solution to the problems that face all of China's peoples in many different areas. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, very provocative and um, um, inspiring talk. Now, I have not been given a copy of Mark's text beforehand. So I thought that my job as a moderator is just to throw out a couple of questions and then so that you can take this time to do your thinking and to take part in this conversation. So um, the, um, there are a couple of points here. I think it's very, very interesting that Mark starts out by telling us about second generation, which is yet another way of saying that 60 years earlier, there was a first generation so why is it or what does it why does it become necessary today for a second generation ethnic policy to be produced or to be manufactured as opposed to 60 years earlier I suppose as a historian of 20th century my instinct would be to go exactly to that moment namely in the neighborhood of 1949, when the first generation of Minzu Zhengze was being formulated. So um, I haven't had a chance to think this through very carefully. But on the whole, um, there are a couple of points. The first issue here is that what were, I mean, if we compare then and now, and drawing on the work of someone like Liu Xiaoyu, Liu Xiaoyuan, what do we get from this comparison? That is, Liu Xiaoyuan's presentation of the formulation of PRC's ethnic policies um, on the eve of the 1949 um, what, uh, Jianguo. So there are a couple points here. The first one was that Liu Xiaoyuan would argue that the ethnic policies at the beginning of the 1950s were formulated during two sets of military confrontations. One was the civil war between the nationalists and the communists, and the other was, well, initially the armed conflicts involving Japan, but in the end, the context of the Cold War, the emerging Cold War, in other words, the politics between 1945 and 1949. And he would also argue that this Minzu Zhengze was critical at that moment to the extent that it would apply to Mongolia, both Inner Mongolia and Outer Mongolia, both about the autonomy or the creation, the recognition of the autonomy of Outer Mongolia, and then also that separation between Inner and Outer Mongolia. So anyway, if we get back to that point, then I suppose in some ways, the questions that we may ask at this moment would be, A, how are the politics, especially within the context of um, shall we say, international as well as domestic confrontations. How have the politics changed between the formulation of the first and the second generation uh, ethnic policies? And second question in that regard would be, if the first generation ethnic policies were formulated within the context of Mongolia, which is not much or not nearly as much a problem today. That is, if the issues have been transferred to Xinjiang or Tibet, how does that sort of difference, spatial difference, um, help color or help I mean, 
imply or entail, necessitate different kinds of thinking. So that's first question. And then the second question here would be something like this. So the Minzu Zhengzhe of the first generation, well, for sure, in Zhang Kai shek in 1943, uh, put forward China's destiny and articulated the whole notion of Zhonghua Minzu and um, advancing the centrality of Minzu as an organizing principle of the future of China after 1945, that is post-war China. Now, when Chiang Kai-shek advances notions about the centrality of Minzu, he was talking against somebody else who put forward his thesis a year later in 1842 under the title of New Democracy. And what, was, what did he have to say? This other fellow insisted, and this Chairman Mao, insisting that uh, class was much more important than ethnicity. So I suppose for us to be reading about the differences between the national or ethnic policies of the two generations, it's notable how that class has become absent. It's conspicuous for its absence in this post-1989 discussion about the constitution of the People's Republic of China. Fei Xiaotong, for instance, right? Even Fei Xiaotong in 1989, when he put forward this whole notion of how that China is this is not no longer mentioning how that this is supposed to be a people's republic by the dictatorship of the proletariat. So in other words, the whole concept of jieji, of class, is conspicuous in this constitutional debate for its absence. And that is perhaps a factor that needs to be taken into account as we consider the prominence or the reformulation of the notion of ethnicity as a foundation for uh, the constitution of, uh, um, of China today. And then the third point here is that Minzu, Zizhi, and Difang in the first, uh, in the uh, ethnic formulations of the 1940s, those three were closely connected. In other words, ethnicity, territoriality, and autonomy or national autonomy. Let's just put it broadly. Issues of governance were closely connected. Now, so, the, uh, for those three um, components to be reconfigured today, a major driving force appears to be the economic or social reality of mobility. In other words, at the beginning of the 21st century, it's not just an issue of the Han people popping up in ethnic minority or in ethnic autonomous regions. It's also the mobility of the minorities showing up in places like Beijing or Shanghai and a whole set of issues attending to that. In other words, the first generation ethnic policies were predicated on the assumption that these were immobile people territorially grounded in specific regions in which up to a point there will be or there would be a certain degree of self-governance or representation. But when mobility introduces deterritorialization, I wonder then to what extent these um, ethnic policies between the two generations might have to be um, changed. And then uh, finally, the whole point about um, about Zuchin Hexie versus the whole issue of say um, um, immigrants or migrants coming into China, and then in other words, the whole model of creating harmony within. China among different groups of people 
the uh, differentiation between Zuchun and Minzu. I suppose, in a way, it's useful to think about the Levinsonian way of questioning, namely, what are the issues that they are trying to resolve, rather than simply the discursive persuasiveness of certain kinds of representations. So what are the issues that the PRC appears to be trying to resolve today? Are these issues of economic, political, or other sorts? Are they trying to enhance or facilitate a higher degree of harmony or to reduce conflict, let's just put it that way, within a group of people who are all already recognized as citizens of the People's Republic of China? Or are they considering ways of granting citizenship to people who are yet to be allowed into the territorial confinements of the People's Republic of China? I mean, I, I suppose they are trying, it's, if we start thinking along those lines, then it would, the, um, your quote of uh, the Articles of the United Nations would make a lot of sense. Namely, it's, it appears to be disputes over resources and claims to land rather than um, citizenship that seem to be the issue that they are seeking to resolve. And this is taking place against the backdrop of um, economic developments facilitating a heightened degree of mobility of the population. So those are just a couple of thoughts that came to my mind, thinking about the potential differences, or if we compare the two paradigms, if there are such things, it's the two paradigms, 60 years earlier versus 60 years later, the sorts of political issues that the PRC is seeking to resolve using either class or ethnicity as a tool for, well, the consolidation and stability of the regime. So those are my broad questions. And then, Mark, you can take it whichever way you like. And I recognize that there are lots of people in this audience who would have many questions to ask. Question. Yeah. yeah, OK, David. Mark, I want to offer two suggestions <clears throat> as to how you can uh, develop this analysis further. Is this on? I guess so. Uh, one having to do with <clears throat> what experiences in societies other than China are applicable to the Chinese thinking through this question. And then uh, uh, second, how you can best explain the weakness of the American case as something that they can build from. Uh, first, <clears throat> on, on cases outside of China, I'm not sure that uh, indigenous is as strong a concept as uh, conquered. And I, I think the theorist that's the most relevant to the line of argument that you're developing is actually the Canadian Will Kimlicka. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the analogy would not be so much to um, aboriginal peoples as to uh, peoples who have been incorporated politically not through immigration, but through political settlement or conquest. So the Basques in Spain are a much more productive e example. Just check the mic. It's working now. Yeah, yeah, we can hear it. Okay. Yes. Uh, so that the, the Basques seem to me to be a much more productive example than, uh, than the Aborigines because of all of the difficulties that you correctly point out concerning indigenous and its uh, uh, legal and other aspects of the term. So Kimblick, it seems to me, is ready-made for all of this, and the examples that he uses on, in Europe and Canada are right on. The, the second suggestion is that <clears throat> I think that when you try to explain to the Chinese why the American case is less useful to them than they might imagine, um, um, it's mostly that the United States uh, diversity ex uh, de uh, is derived so extensively from immigration, which is at least uh, um, uh, ostensibly voluntary, and in most cases actually voluntary, and this creates a whole different context for it. Um, and I would say that <clears throat> 
the uh, sort of critique that you mount of the melting pot concept uh, is not helpful to you. Uh, most of us who work on the history of uh, ethnicity in the United States, we have all these statistics that something like 80 to 90 percent of the people who descend from the Irish, the Polish, and the Italian immigrants are now vastly intermarried. Uh, and even with the case to um, enslaved peoples, the African Americans in the year 2008, 20 percent of the self-identified African males who got married mailed, uh, married uh, non-African American women. So even with the even with the case of the African Americans, this is changing, but with all the other groups, and the Asian Americans uh, in uh, many segments uh, between the ages of 21 and 45 are out marrying in, in many localities at 60 and 70 percent. So um, from the point of view of the history of social science, I would say that Glazer and Moynihan's, and I, I adore Matt Glazer, I mean, he's a friend of mine, but I think that the Beyond the Melting Pot of 50 years ago was the most completely wrong-headed book in the entire history of American social science. So that's, you, re just, you raise a lot of red herrings for yourself in talking about the melting pot concept. The, what, but what I want to suggest also is that <clears throat> the, the, uh, what I found the most striking about the uh, 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 accounts that you give and the quotations from these people, they don't seem to be talking about the potential for the Han to change. Now, they're talking about the changing of the other people. You had one great quote from some guy saying that the Hans are a very, you know, accommodating, incorporating people. Okay. Now, if you want to play the American game at all, the key to the melting pot in the United States was that other groups. Um, had reason to believe that it wasn't simply that they were becoming copies of what was already there, but they were becoming integral to it. So the amalgamation narrative in the United States involves the changing of the Anglo-Protestants so that all will be changed. That goes back even to Zangwell's melting pot of 1908, where the, the, the key uh, section of it is where a Jewish immigrant castigates a Mayflower descendant and says, I will throw you into the fiery cauldron and you will be changed. So the melting pot ideology itself is not a matter of everything being copied, but an amalgamation. And if the Chinese do not have a plan for changing the Han, then I don't see anywhere in the, in the plans that you're quoting from them a realistic plan from the future. They have to have a plan to change the Han. Take more questions, or do you, do you want to respond? Thank you. Of the people on both sides, is there a discussion of what nationalities policy uh, delivers for minorities themselves? And is there a sense that maybe the, the first generation policy hasn't been a success? And here I'm thinking of you talk about equality, but also on the material side, uh, what the first generation policy has actually done. Uh, like a lot of professors of a certain age, all I do is read my own students' work. And I have two <laughs> students who are working on issues. One gave a talk the other day uh, about how co-ethnics and religious uh, leaders, uh, the closer they come to power, the less they represent the people. Uh, in this case, it had to do with land taking, so that they would stand up to land takings if they were out of power when they became powerful. Uh, they didn't. I have another student working on public goods provision in ethnic minority areas, uh, not sensitive minorities. And though her findings are still tentative, it looks like it doesn't really matter a whole lot if uh, there are people of your group representing you, at least in China. So maybe not on the equality side, but certainly on the material side. Uh, is there a sense that this first generation policy was not a success at all? And how does that inform uh, the debate uh, that, that's going on? Or are people even thinking about those sort of issues? You've talked about preferences a little bit and whether preferences would go away. Uh, but is there even a sense that the preferences haven't really made much difference uh, up to now? And how does that figure into the discussion? Uh, I have a sort of similar comment. Um, my question is, is anyone talking to these minorities and asking them what their grievances actually are, what sort of differences they really want to have from Han culture, and are, are these fundamental differences that are not um, 
<clears throat> that can't really work with uh, the PRC and the structure of the government? Uh, are these fundamental differences that can't be overcome? Are they happy? And are they happy being called uh, indigenous people? <laughs> would they consider themselves? Uh, would they like that formulation? The part at the part at the end of the analysis, where what's being brought into the policy debate is a discussion of whether where China fits in comparative perspective, and that's a really common feature of a lot of different policy debates. You know, what can we learn from X X country? But in the policy debates that I'm familiar with, the discussion of which country to learn from is kind of a code. Um, you know, should we learn from the United States? Should we be learning from India? That that is actually a kind of code for a political stance that the speaker is taking about whether westernization is a good idea or not, about whether there should be a Chinese way of doing things, and about the best model for China's future. So I was interested to hear in your example um, if that seemed to be true as well. So I'll, I'll start from the end and, and work my way uh, to the beginning. Um, so the, if I can ask you a, 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 a follow-up question. In the debates that you're looking at, uh, what, are the, what, what are the, can you give me an example of, of a, a case where the, the country that's being compared to is the, the kind of the, gives away what the uh, political agenda is of the person who is making the comparison or the, the unit that's making the comparison? Yeah, I'm mostly thinking about debates on law. Okay. So that's what I look at. So the question of the legal system, is there a constant state of you know, trying to be perfected? So the country that has the most resonance, of course, is America. And this debate about Americanization um, of the legal system um, really versus a Jewish Chinese way of doing things tends to map onto a debate about political liberalization. Right. Gotcha. So um, I guess I would say that uh, I, I, I go back and look at and see which, which countries are being uh, brought up for comparison. I mean, the United States is certainly one of the most common, uh, but there are those who um, have uh, criticized, uh, say, Ma Rong for, for um, the, uh, the examples he takes because they, they point out, as, as Professor Hollinger mentioned, um, those are immigrant peoples. And Tibetans are not immigrants. Mongols are not immigrants. So the the basis this is this is not a valid uh, a valid point of, of of comparison. But I don't I haven't seen that I haven't seen people saying well we should be comparing to the situation in I don't know India mm -hmm. say that's totally absent from any any conversation whatsoever about about uh, the, um, the the ethnic mosaic in China. Mm -hmm. No one is comparing that. Um, it's only ever industrialized Western democracies. Um, and I guess um, I'm struck by the fact that this, that's happening because for so many years, the discussion was only about how unique China's ethnic situation was. And that this was not, I mean, the only country that had any kind of a, 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 a with which any kind of a comparison was made was the USSR. Right. And after 1989 or 1991, that was no longer a very convenient comparison to be making. And so that actually, um, I think, gets a little bit to, to, to Kevin's point. Um, uh, is there a sense, your question was, is there a sense that the policy was not a success? There's not really any discussion that I have seen about the, uh, the delivery of public goods and what sorts of advantages have accrued to non-Han peoples through the uh, enactment of these policies. It seems to be taken for granted that um, the policies have done what they were supposed to do. And if anything, in fact, I would say that the critique is that the policies have been too successful. And that there is the same, among some people, there's the same sort of, of um, regret that we saw in the former USSR, where people uh, wrote after uh, the fall of the country 
that um, they, in fact, uh, were hoist by their own petard because they had created nations where there weren't nations before. They had given them all the infrastructure, everything that they needed to become independent, and look what happened. So I think that there are a number, I think Ma Rong, and certainly the two Hus are in this group of, you know, we should stop helping to create a sense of nationhood among non-Han peoples. This is not going to end well. And we, our policies have done a lot to do that. We've given them names, we've given them territory, we've given them political structures, we've given them education, we've given them all kinds of social goods. And one day, uh, this is going to go the same way. I mean, uh, to me, that's the drumbeat in the background, is look what happened in, in Russia. And in, in a few of the quotations I provided, I think you can, we, can, we can see that quite, uh, quite, qu quite clearly. Uh, so, in fact, it's not that the policy was not a success, but that the policy was maybe has been too, too successful and not in the way that was intended because clearly the idea was that, and this is, uh, gets back to Wen, Wen Xin's point, the idea was that these were all stopgap measures 60 years ago. These were done to uh, solve a problem of uh, ethnic uh, uh, categorization, finding a way to fit people into a new polity, but that this was all temporary and it was all going to go away because class struggle was going to eradicate all of these sorts of divisions between people. Religion was going to go away and everybody was going to become uh, the good communist woman or man. And the disappearance of, of, of a class discourse is, I mean, I think, I mean, you, you can, you, I'm sure, can, can, can say much more about this, but this is just so, so striking that we don't see this, at least I don't see it very much, uh, in what the party talks about anymore. And the debate that has come out um, on this matter, again, the, the, the whole, there's no mention of, of, of class struggle. There's no, no belief anymore at all that ethnicity is going away anytime soon. Uh, and we have to help make it go away. And the way to do that is, you know, more exchange, uh, more, uh, uh, more fusion and, and, and all the rest of it. And then the question is, well, how to, how to affect that kind of a solution? What I have seen, yeah, well, I guess what I've seen is that the comparison, the base, it depends what you want to take as the baseline. And if your baseline is 1950, then well, things are definitely, most of these places, a lot better than, than they were, you know, then. Um, but... Right, right. I mean, people do take that, do take that point of view, including here in California, right? So um, I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to leave the impression that, that there's nobody in the state who is, in, nobody in, in government who is, who is uh, aware of the, of the problems of poverty and immiseration and lack of education in non-Han areas. There are a lot of people who are quite aware of this and are working very hard to try and solve those problems, for sure. Um, but that's not part of this debate about ethnic identity, that the ethnic identity problem um, to, to go to, to, to Wen Xin's uh, questions, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very much about economics. I think it's very much about territory. It's, it's so true what you say about the fact that when um, the, um, the different ethnic groups, the different uh, minority nationalities were created in the 50s, territoriality was one of the things that had to be there. And everybody was given their own place. That you had to have that. You had to have your own autonomous region. That was part of what it meant to be a minority nationality. And this has come out, it comes out very, very clearly in discussions about the, uh, recreating the Manchus in the 50s. Because of all of the minority nationalities, the Manchus were the only one not given any territory at all. And when there was discussion, I, we've, we have some of the notes. I'm, I'm working on this project with a colleague in Beijing, Ding Yi Duang at the Academy of uh, Social Sciences. Uh, and we have some of the notes from, from the discussions then. And it's, one person says, well, but if we don't give Manchus uh, their own autonomous county at least, 
um, this will not look right compared to all the other people and uh, all the other minority peoples. And, and the, uh, one of the senior academics, actually, who's there says, well, why don't you just go and, why don't we just go and establish another Manchukuo and be done with it? Uh, so, and it's only in 1983, right, when they come back and they reestablish. I mean, this is it's actually not the second generation. It's really more like the third generation ethnic policy, right? Because they had to be all redone again in the late 70s uh, and, in the, and in the early 80s. Uh, so that territoriality part of it was really, really strong. And uh, you're, I think you're quite right. If, if we get rid of, if we see a reform in the Hukou system, and this is one of the big reforms that people are talking about that might happen, right? If the, if the Hukou reform really happens and people can leave, then uh, the whole idea of, of an autonomous region belonging to Group X or Group Y stops making very much sense anymore. And these people will flood, in, or many of them anyway, you can imagine, will flood into the cities where there is work to be done. And we have intimations of what this is like already in er some areas on the East Coast where um, we have colonies of migrant workers, particularly from Xinjiang, who've brought in, right, the whole problems in Xinjiang that happened in 2009 were the result of, of ethnic conflict in, in these factory dormitories. So that kind of a problem, you can imagine, will become much, much, more, uh, much more common. And David, let me just thank you. You're the second person in the last week to mention Will Kimlicka's work to me. So I definitely have to go uh, and... Uh, uh, and, and take a look at that and your comments on, on the, the melting pot. I uh, uh, have to do some, some, re some revision on that. Thank you very much. Uh, and then your question about, um, is anybody talking to the non-Han about what they want and are their demands uh, irreconcilable with national policy? And I don't, I don't think they necessarily are, in fact. Uh, because, I mean, when policies, it's the same policies now as in the 80s and in the 90s are just being, in, uh, well, it's not entirely true. Some policies have been changed, particularly on language policy, uh, especially in the elementary schools. But I think, you know, that the, a lot of people, what a lot of people are saying is we have these laws about autonomy. Let's enforce those laws. So in principle, there, the, the mechanisms for solving a lot of the tension, I think, are there. The question is implementing the policies that have already been written that are not really being um, pursued very well. And, and part of that has to do with the fact that local cadres who rise to positions of power in these autonomous regions end up, as, as, as your student is finding out, um, they are co-opted by the system. Uh, and, I mean, that's no surprise, I think. Uh, that's, uh, that's, how, that's how power works, right? Um, yeah, people are talking to them, for sure. Uh, there are conferences all the time that are, you know, cadres are flying out to Urumqi, they're flying to Lhasa, they're, I mean, everybody is aware there are big problems. No one is pretending that there aren't any problems anymore. Right. So, and, and there is a lot of information that is being gathered about what can be done, but enforcing good policy is never easy anywhere, right? So. Uh, is, is the tension and the pressure coming more from those regions, or is it coming from the population centers in Beijing and Shanghai that people want change in these policies? Where is the Well, I mean, the hotspots are every time you have another self-immolation in uh, uh, one of the Tibetan communities, either in, in the TAR or, or in, in Sichuan or, 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 or Qinghai or Gansu. Um, there, when, I mean, it was just a couple of weeks ago, we read about uh, another, uh, um, more, more, more shootings in, in uh, I believe it was in Khotan. Uh, man, that's, those are where the hot spots are. Um, I, and I think that in terms of pressure being applied, I mean, that's one way to apply pressure, right, is people get so frustrated that they re resort to violence. But in terms of this debate, the, the, the people who are writing these uh, 
articles are for the most part in Beijing. But it's interesting, they're often doing their publications in Xinjiang University, Xinjiang Daishui Shuibao, in the Xinjiang University Journal, or in the Heilong University Journal. I mean, sometimes it's in a central journal. But often, I mean, the Xinjiang one has been a very common place for a lot of this stuff to, to appear. Uh, and um, I don't know more about why it is that like, that journal somehow has got a license to publish articles of this sort. And it's, you know, they, they, clearly you can, you can go further, you can push the limits more there um, than you can in, in, uh, in other places. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, Rachel's questions. So one of them having to do with, <clears throat> again, with this um, question of affirmative action and whether or not the, it, it does seem as though a, a lot of what you're looking at are um, intellectuals talking about this and whether there's some other discourse somewhere else that makes a bigger deal about certain other issues that the intellectuals don't actually want to say explicitly. And so, for example, this idea that you know, with the with the entrance exams, that it's so unfair that these that these minorities get all of these advantages, because you do see a lot of people, you you hear a lot of people talking about that, yeah. but probably the intellectuals won't. And are there other issues of of that sort? Um, and then the second point, having to do with the the U.S. Um, as some kind of code word for something. And, and there, I think it's also interesting that sometimes you encounter the, the you know, it's either you're the U.S. or you're kind of the anti-U.S. model, that what China is doing is the, it, is, it seems to me sometimes comes off as the, as the anti-U.S. model. And whether or not, you know, just how the, how the U.S. ends up in the, in the being used and whether or not there's, a, there's been a shift in the last few years, it, it seems to me it, that I've encountered um, the, the U.S. model being used a little bit differently over the you know the last few years. I don't know if this is right. I mean, people who have who are a little closer in time period to to my specialty in the Tang Song may have a, a greater sense of this, but but I would be interested. Is the U.S. being used in in Tang Song studies? Um, no, no. no? <laughs> That's I, I'm what I'm saying is that that. Um, people working in later periods might have more of a sense of how the, the uh -huh. U.S. model has changed, uh, been, been used differently in the in the past um, past decade. Well, that might be a question that Rachel can answer better than better than I can. So, um, I'm not sure. And that would be interesting to see, actually, is you know, in, in which. Hmm. Could actually, could actually easily. easily. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the affirmative action thing and, and entrance exams, this is not, uh, the criticisms I have seen have not, um, have not begun by saying, by listing the, 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 the problems of, the, of resentment or of, uh, um, uh, inequality that, that, say, Han might feel about the fact that non-Han, even if they grew up in the city and, in fact, are uh, socioeconomically no less well-off than themselves, but they still get extra points. Um, I've never seen any, anything that takes that head on. I think that, that everybody, it's assumed that everybody understands that, that this is the case and that this is going on. Uh, I think it's assumed that people know that in a lot of these smaller autonomous regions, that abuse of power is very, very common. I don't know if it's more common than in other parts of the country, but I do know of, of, of you know, you do hear of cases of uh, Han. This happens, I think, more in Mongolia, in Inner Mongolia than anywhere else, but um, Han Chinese who are um, interested in um, land speculation and who pay a local cadre whatever it takes to be reclassified as a Mongol, as a Mongutu, because then that enables them to certain economic privileges that come with being a, a Mongolian in Inner Mongolia that, that they can then take advantage of. Um, and you're not supposed to be able to change your ethnic identity after the age of 18. 
in China. But you know, as with all things, you know, these are more like guidelines to cite Jeffrey Rush from Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, my usual standard of reference is uh, popular culture. Um, so that's not front and center. I haven't seen, like, we need to fix these things in the, in the ethnic policies that we have. That may be there, but it's not part of the discourse that's been going around whether, uh, whether to keep present policies and fix them or move on to a whole different set of policies and just trash the whole minority group um, ethnic identity uh, system altogether. I think there was another question here, maybe? Are we running out of time? We're running a little okay. Out of time. We haven't quite pulled out all the stops, but we've pulled out some of the stops. Okay. And we've got an above average reception waiting outside. Oh, okay. So let's give Joe Escher the last question here. I think he had one. And then we'll give you all a chance to ask uh, uh, any more questions, Mark, any more at the reception. Uh, um, the, the, the one most obvious difference between the Soviet nationalities policy and the Chinese and the way they've carried it out is the Chinese always insisted that Han be the first party secretary in the autonomous regions. Um, and uh, two things. I, I wonder, do the second generation scholars discuss that problem openly? I've kind of thought that was seemed to be a verboten uh, topic that I haven't, uh, people talk about it, but I haven't seen it written about. But secondly, I'm, I'm curious, when did the Chinese realize that that was going to be a good idea to hold their empire together. Um, when did that actually start? Obviously, it started long before the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So they, you know, they seem to have had forebodings uh, well in advance. And as far as I know, it starts very early. But um, uh, again, I, I put it to the experts. That's that's. Uh that's a great question, actually. I, I don't. Uh, I, I have one answer, which I'll give you in just a second. I don't know if it's the the the, the answer you're looking for, but yeah, I think there, there there are two things that are different. One is that, as you say, um, the person who was the nominal head of the uh, of the political hierarchy was always a member of the local ethnic group, but the party secretary was never was always Han. The other thing that's really different is that there were communist parties in each of the um, um, uh, SSSRs. So there was, a, there was an Uzbek Communist Party, there was a Kazakh Communist Party, uh, there was a, 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 you know, a Tajik Communist Party, Georgian Communist Party, etc. And the, the, apparently, and as far as I understand, in the early years of the PRC, there was some discussion about whether to do that or not. And Mao did not want to go that far in creating a whole bunch of smaller communist parties. So there's just one Chinese communist party. Now that's the other big difference. As far as you know, where did they get the idea for putting uh, Han in as first party secretary, my thought is that they were just following Manchu policy. But of course, I would think that, wouldn't I? Uh, because as we know, in the Qing, uh, there were, uh, we kept presidents of the boards, but there was always a Manchu president and the Han president of all the, each of the heads of the six boards, and the top ranking president was always a Manchu. And we also know that there were provincial governors, but that there were governor generals, right, as Kent Guy has in, in, studied in his recent book. And the governor gen, governor's general, for the most part, about 80% of the time, I think is the number, and it varies over time, these were always Manchus. So you had a Manchu governor general over provinces where there would be a Han, maybe a Han governor or other sorts of lower officials who were Han. But they, they kept their people in place to make sure that they had uh, uh, eyes on the, on the local situation. Did, did this really inform their choice of uh, uh, making first party secretaries Han in, in the PRC? We just have to do a little bit more research, I guess, Joe. Thanks, though. Well, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the Manchu Manchu tree. I didn't even know they curved in. Oh, yeah. TV tree, and all of my friends were busy discovering that they were now being considered Manchu. <laughs> they were trying to figure out how they could angle this yeah. in some way, and what sort of preferences this was going to give them. I had no part of that the word Manchu, and I had an identity of many of them that did huh. not have very good at all. Well, as, as a Berkeley graduate, I think the only uh, 
preferences that we can give you. It's more <laughs> welcome, and I hope some interesting questions that helped you think about the project and our appreciation for coming here today and sharing your most recent research with us. So thank you very much. Thank and you. Thanks very much.